Hello, I'm Roger Bisby from the Skill Builder channel, and in this video, I want to talk about electric vehicles, electric vans more specifically, but we might as well include cars in that. Now, whenever I talk about anything that's to do with climate change or reducing carbon, people think I'm automatically against it, that I'm automatically against any change. And that's simply not true, because I like to see wind turbines, and I love solar as well. I've got solar panels on my own house, and I even like heat pumps in the right place and the right time and when it comes to electric vehicles i also love them we've had electric vans on test and i've had a great time with them they're nippy and of course they don't pollute the air and whatever your views are on climate change and carbon reduction i don't think there are many people that can put up a convincing argument against breathing cleaner air. So if it wasn't for the anxiety of the range and the fact that I think electric vehicles still have a way to go, I'd be a big fan of them. But what I actually want to talk about here is our government's approach to it and the Europeans and the Americans included in that, if you like. Now, the trouble is with electric vans specifically is they still don't have the kind of range which would allow me and many others to work normally. As soon as you put a load of tools in them, that figure that you get on the brochure goes way down. And when I've used electric vans in the past, I'm not exaggerating to say we've spent nearly half a day driving round trying to find a charging point that works and then when we charge it up it's not giving us the full charge and we ended up limping home in fact when we came back from Colchester we had to take all the tools out of the vehicle just to make sure we could get home and we limped around the M25 on tortoise mode and when I got home I was a nervous wreck I thought never again tomorrow I'm taking my diesel van now, even if we assume that at the current rate of installing charging points, we're going to be up and ready by 2035, which is the new date for banning the production of petrol and diesel cars, it still leaves the little matter of the not inconsiderable cost of electric vehicles. Now, I think it's fair to say that when you look at any European made electric vehicle, and I'm including the UK in that, or even an American made electric vehicle, the cost of them is way beyond the average person. Which means that in 2035, when they do actually ban the production of diesel and petrol cars, people will be hanging on to those old bangers for a lot longer than they otherwise might have done. There is an answer to all this, China. Because if you get a Chinese-made electric vehicle, it's roughly half the price of one made in Europe. Now, I know there's lots of people who'll be turning their nose up at the Chinese or the idea of a Chinese electric vehicle and saying, oh, we want something a bit decent. But if you haven't seen Chinese electric vehicles lately, take another look because although they did have trouble with their first early models and even to the extent that they produced thousands and thousands of them parked them up in fields and then put them back in for recycling they scrapped the whole lot because the Chinese were thinking about protecting their brand image if you like and they didn't want to produce substandard cars and release them onto the world market and get themselves a bad name a bit like the Swiss when anything comes out of Switzerland the government makes sure it's up to a certain standard because they see made in Switzerland as a brand that is worth protecting and the Chinese are now playing that game now, you might think that a lot of this is to do with cheap Chinese labor, but it's really about investment. Because if you look at the modern electric vehicle car factories in China and van factories, of course, you'll see that they're the size of a small town and they're manned almost entirely by robots. And the precision of those robots and the way that they can work 24 seven without a tea break means that they're producing cars now to the kind of tolerances which just aren't possible with human beings. When we talk about their tolerances, we're talking about 0.0001 of a millimeter about the thickness of a human hair so when those robots put those cars together there is no such thing as a friday car now the reason that all this automation has been made possible is because Many years ago, the Chinese government had the foresight to say, well, we're not very good at producing diesel and petrol cars. Let's not even try and compete in that market. It'll take us years and years to catch up. What we do is we concentrate 
everything on producing electric vehicles and we'll make sure we do the best possible job. Now, not only that, but at the same time, they had the foresight to invest in all the world's resources for lithium and cobalt. They bought up mines, they invested in infrastructure, and they now control, I think it's fair to say, about 90% of the world's production of batteries. And unless we come up with some new technology which makes those batteries redundant, they have got us all by the short and curlies. Now this government investment, some people may say, oh, that's not fair. The European Union introduced laws that prohibited any government from investing in industry because they didn't want to create unfair competition among the member states. So it was a hands-off laissez-faire approach, which I think is in many ways a very good thing. I mean, capitalism has worked very well in providing for the future, but you can see the point where the Chinese government's intervention and massive, massive investment has paid off handsomely for them. So we see that the Chinese are controlling the market in batteries and the European Union Union and America's answer to all this is that they're going to say, OK, we're going to put up tariffs. We're going to try and block the imports of cheap Chinese electric vehicles. But of course, they're not going to do that on a protectionist basis. What they're doing is they're coming up with excuses for not importing Chinese vehicles. And one of those is using the what we call the Modern Slavery Act or the EU equivalent, which means that they won't import any goods which are made by slave labor. And there is some evidence that the Chinese are using forced labour to kind of re-educate the people in those factories. But as I said, most of those factories are controlled by robots. So unless you consider robots to be slave labour, I think they've lost that argument. So the Americans have come up with another trick. They're saying, oh, it's a question of national security. If the Chinese are providing all these electric vehicles, they can monitor the movements of our population. And in event of some kind of hostility, they could even turn the vehicles off, make them all immobile. Well, I should imagine that's quite possible. You've got to ask why they would want to do that. Did they invest all that time and money in producing world-beating electric vehicles at a price that everybody could afford just to sabotage their whole market? I don't think so. So I think it's a measure of desperation that the Americans are looking at that excuse of national security. And of course, the other thing is that Donald Trump, when he was in power last, slapped a 27 percent tariff on imported Chinese electric vehicles. And if he comes back into power, he's saying that he's going to put 100 percent tariff on. Now, even 100 percent tariff still won't make them more expensive than one that's produced in America. And the other thing they've done is they've shot themselves in the foot slightly because they've introduced this trade agreement with Mexico where they can import goods from Mexico completely tariff free so they can go both ways. So what the Chinese have cleverly done there is that they've set up a factory in Mexico and they're bringing over cars which aren't quite finished, but they only need a little bit of work on them and then they can give them that made in Mexico stamp and introduce them into the United States completely free of any tariff. So you may wonder why the West was so complacent and asleep on the job that they let the Chinese gain this dominant position, not only in car manufacturing, but also in battery manufacturing. So interestingly, among all these arguments, nobody's really talking about the environmental impact of importing all these cars from China. I mean, we all know that the Chinese rely heavily at the moment upon coal to produce their steel, and that has an environmental impact and also shipping those cars halfway across the world. And they also say that when an electric car arrives on the forecourt, it has embedded carbon in it and it will take 60,000 miles before you even break, even on an environmental front. So until you've done 60,000 miles, you're no better off than driving your petrol or your diesel car. Apart from, of course, the air pollution, which I've already said is a major thing. The UK has recently proudly announced that we are exceeding our carbon reduction targets. And before you give yourself a pat on the back for that, the reason that we've been able to do that is simply that we've exported all our pollution to India and to China. We now produce the square root of all.
But of course, the only real argument that anybody's got against these Chinese vehicles is economic, because like it or not, there is no way in the world that we are ever going to compete with China. There is one small glimmer of hope, if you like, and that is that the Chinese are considering opening up factories in Europe and they're looking at the UK as one of the possible sites. It's all about protecting our home industries and like it or not, as much as we put on tariffs and come up with all kinds of excuses for not importing Chinese electric vehicles and try and push the price up so that we can compete with them, it means that the average person is going to find an electric vehicle way beyond their means. At the very time that the government is saying you can no longer drive a petrol or a diesel vehicle, they're putting those other alternatives out of our reach. Which means that motoring will once again become an elite pastime. When I grew up in the 1950s on my council estate, you could look up and down the road and there were very, very few cars there. Anybody who had a car was either very clever or a criminal. So yet again, the drive to save the planet penalizes the poor. You may ask what Elon Musk is doing in all this. Well, Elon Musk has readily admitted that nobody can compete with the Chinese on price. He's obviously got his Teslas, he's got his high range, and there was some talk of him producing a lower price car but he's now starting to concentrate, he's moved his focus to driverless taxis. So in other words, the average person will no longer need to own a car, you can just summon using your app a driverless taxi which will arrive at your door and take you wherever you want to go. So Elon Musk clearly doesn't know the British because when those driverless taxis arrive at our door, they'd be full of discarded junk food wrappers, empty lager cans and vomit. They truly will be the people's car. <laughs> Come back and see me soon and please do let me know your thoughts on electric vehicles. Do you think they're the future? Do you think this will all end happily and that I'm just a miserable, grumpy old git? <laughs> That's undoubtedly true.